Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. So I took a little bit of time off this week, which left less time for a video. So I thought I'd talk about something simple and that I know quite a lot about, and you know, kind of keep it light. So in this video, we're going to address the multifaceted functions of the cellular tumour antigen P53 in response to cellular insults in pre-neoplastic tissues and how it is mediated at both a transcriptional and post-transcriptional level. <laughs> I'm joking. <clears throat> Or am I? But in all seriousness, whilst I do put in many waking hours into this channel, I am also doing a PhD on the world's coolest protein. Oh, hang on. I'm not quite sure what happened to my voice there. Let me try again. On the world's coolest protein. Okay, that didn't work. But because this is so cool, it's been well studied. And while trying to keep up with literature whilst conducting experiments and trying to analyse data takes a lot of time, time which I evidently have sparingly. So partly for my own benefit, and also because there has been some interest in what I actually do, I thought in this video I'd cover some interesting focus points on this protein and unaddressed questions. So where is the P53 field at? Well, to really understand that question, you first need to know what P53 actually is. And well, it's a protein. The world's coolest protein. But this protein is a transcription factor. So what that means is that it can bind to DNA and activate the expression of different genes. And so P53 doesn't just do this all the time. It only seems to do this when it's activated in response to different stresses. So what happens usually is that in a cell P53 gets expressed, but then it gets degraded, and this is because of a protein known as MDM2. It tags P53 for degradation. And so in normal, unstressed conditions, the levels of P53 are quite low in a cell. However, when there's stress, whether it's reactive oxygen species, expression of an oncogene, DNA damage, extreme hypoxic conditions, these all cause stabilisation of P53. And so when P53 is stabilised, it can activate these different genes. And P53 does this by binding to its so-called P53 response element. And so it's just a consensus sequence on DNA that the DNA binding domain of P53 recognises and can bind to. And then it brings in the transcriptional machinery to upregulate these different genes. But the interesting thing is that P53 seems to be a kind of stress-dependent decision transcription factor. Basically, it seems to mediate the decision between a variety of different responses to cellular stress. And so these different responses include the induction of cell cycle arrest, cell death, most notably apoptosis, cellular senescence, DNA repair, and metabolic changes, and cellular differentiation. And so these mechanisms are not necessarily mutually exclusive, as the immediate action of P53 most often seems to be a cell cycle arrest. And this cell cycle arrest is to help tell the cell, stop guys, that's a problem, we need to fix it. And it can help activate DNA repair in regions of damage. And so if that damage is repaired, the idea is that the cell then goes back to normal. And if it's not repaired and the damage is more severe or it just keeps on building, it then decides to go into cell death or it could enter cellular senescence and have a variety of other changes. And so some of the key questions are, how is P53 mediating these different downstream responses? And well, yeah, that's a pretty good question. And there's been a lot of work that has already tried to, to evaluate this. In fact, I just finished reading a nice review article that summarised the life versus death decision of P53. But you might be wondering, why should we really care about how P53 coordinates this decision between cell death versus cell survival, which is cellular senescence? whereby the cell is still alive, it's just arrested permanently and secretes all these inflammatory factors. Well, there's actually several reasons. One, it's just interesting to understand the molecular underpinnings because you can then highlight specific pathways or protein targets that can be therapeutically targeted to manipulate this decision process. For example, if you understood how it was coordinating apoptosis over senescence, you could you might be able to therapeutically cause it to go one way or the other. And in fact, this has already been done, for example, in the use of senolytics, which are drugs that can selectively kill senescent cells. And this is because, as I've just been saying, senescent cells seem to upregulate genes that promote pro-survival instead of apoptosis. And so there was the rationale that if you can acutely activate P53 in these senescent cells, 
it would upregulate apoptosis and cause cellular death. And at least two senolytic strategies have exploited this. The first one is the development of drugs that could inhibit the interaction between P53 and MDM2. Remember MDM2 being that degrader of P53. And that can be seen in UBX0101, which, well, albeit <laughs> had a little bit of a failure last year, but was trying to use that strategy to enhance the lysis of those senescent cells. An alternative strategy used this cell penetrating peptide that inhibited an interaction between P53 and a protein known as FOXO4. And by inhibiting this interaction, it causes the relocalization of P53 from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And this localization can alter P53's function that can cause apoptosis. And it was nicely shown in this 2017 study that application of this FOXO4 peptide could restore fitness, hair density and renal function in naturally aged mice. So further understanding this decision process of P53 between apoptosis and cellular senescence could definitely aid the discovery of new senolytic approaches. But irrespective of whether apoptosis or cellular senescence is induced, both of these responses could be seen as tumor suppressive mechanisms because they stop a damaged cell from further replicating and potentially causing tumorigenesis. And so for these reasons, P53 is often referred to as a tumor suppressor. And so therefore, it may not be surprising to hear that mutations in the gene encoding P53 are the most common event in human cancers. And out of these different mutations in P53, the most common are so-called missense mutations. And these are most frequent in the DNA binding domain of P53. And so a missense mutation refers to the fact that the mutation changes the amino acid from one to another. And so a full length P53 protein is generated it just has a single amino acid substitution. But because it's in the DNA binding domain, it seems to reduce the ability of P53 to actually bind DNA. And so a consequence of this missense mutation is often just called loss of function. But these missense mutations are more interesting than that because they can also have so-called dominant negative effect, whereby if you've got a missense mutant P53 in a cell, at the same time as a wild type, a normal functioning copy of P53, it can form these heterotetramers, whereby the mutants can antagonize the ability of the wild type normal copy to bind DNA. But even more interestingly, there's also so-called gain of function properties allocated to these missense mutants of P53, whereby they seem to be doing all sorts of other things that a normal wild type copy of P53 wouldn't do. And so the reason I told you all this is because as much as I love P53, I actually study its evil non-identical twin, these missense mutations, and um, how they can implicate the function of wild type P53, especially in the early stages of tumor genesis, so before there's even a tumor. And I mean, that in itself sounds a little bit challenging because finding a model for pre-cancer is quite hard because, well, the tumor hasn't occurred yet. Anyway, one way I can try to explore this implication of mutant P53 is by studying cellular senescence, which is pretty much what I'm trying to do in my project in the simplest terms. Um, And it kind of does change on a monthly basis anyway. So yeah, that's just a general area of my interest. And um, it's important for me not to kind of like overhype my work and say it's like the most important thing in the world because, well, I don't know. (laughs) But it does seem to be the case that at least one of your cells in your body does have a mutated allele of P53. And therefore, it's interesting to understand how it could further cause different diseases. Obviously, as a cancer researcher, I'm going to talk about it from a cancer perspective. But P53 mutations have also been implicated in different age-associated diseases, such as fibrosis and and innate immunity. And so um, it's kind of like opening Pandora's box. But at the moment, we kind of understand mutant P53 better in the cancer context, as in tumor tissues, there seems to be the stabilization of mutant P53. And so some kind of cool work is being done to try and understand whether drugs can be used to convert mutant P53 into the wild type copy, and therefore have high protein abundance of wild type P53, which could then induce apoptosis, specifically in tumor cells. And that drug is Primer 1. And so this table you can see here just shows a variety of different mechanisms 
that are being researched to reduce the abundance of mutant p53 in hope that it could reduce the tumorigenic properties of these mutated cells. And so it's interesting to note that on this list of compounds, it also includes mTOR inhibitors and metformin, which are both obviously linked with longevity and lifespan enhancements. And so it could be questioned as to whether some of the benefits seen in these studies in terms of reducing cancer incidence in these different mouse models by treating them with different longevity supplements could be due to re- reducing the ability of mutant p53 to accumulate in cells and cause mayhem. <laughs> but um, honestly, at the moment, I think there's just still a lot to be explored in this area, which makes it very interesting to study, um, but also very complicated just due to the nature of p53 and its uh, ability to be involved in every single cellular process. <laughs> well, maybe not every single process, but a lot of them. Um, but it makes it fun and I enjoy studying it. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this, I guess a little bit different video, insight into what it is I get up to in the research lab and learned more about the world's coolest protein. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I hope you've learned something and thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.